So, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of today. On behalf of my co-chair, Olivia Pagani, I welcome you to this new event session. We will do it as in the sessions before. We will have the four presentations and then have a discussion and Q&A at the end of the session. So, I would like to call the first speaker. This is Nadia Harbeck from the University of Munich. Um, to speak about emergent strategies in neoadjuvant and treatment of patients with HER2 positive early breast cancer. Thank you, Sibyl, dear Olivia, dear, dear colleagues. When we talk about emergent strategies in HER2 positive early breast cancer, I think it's worthwhile to see where we come from, then where we're going to, because we're not only doing trials, we're also treating patients, so we need to talk about standards and drugs delivery and duration, and then also look into the future, where do we want to go, how can we de-escalate, escalate in a smart way, and, and increase the magnitude of benefit for our patients. And since we all treat patients, and not only here as trialists, I would like to close then with the current algorithm on how I see her 2 positive early breast cancer evolving. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Weiner at his lunch lecture because he actually looked at many more trials than I can do in 20 minutes, and it's very important to see all the original work as well. So therapy strategies in early breast cancer are very simple, and we split the sessions exactly. We've talked about luminal before with triple negative and HER2 positive in this session. And actually, the, uh, this panel two years ago already endorsed um, neoadjuvant therapy for HER2 positive uh, stage two and stage three breast cancer just because it could have implications for surgery and radiotherapy and we could tell the PCR patients about their good prognosis and in those in two years ago we didn't even have an option for the non-PCR patients so I think this was a really forward-looking way of endorsing new adjuvant therapy as a standard in HER2 positive early breast cancer. Where do we come from? I think the NOAA trial is unique it's the first and last trial to add anti-HER2 therapy to chemotherapy in HER2 positive patients in the neoadjuvant setting. And what we see in this trial is that without trastuzumab, these patients, these tumors are chemosensitive. So we have about the same response rates in HER2 negative and HER2 positive without trastuzumab, but it's actually the anti-HER2 therapy that increases the PCR rate, almost doubles it. And Dr. Weiner pointed out at his lunch, lunchtime lecture that this trial actually we could see an impact of increased PCR and outcome because we just added a modality of treatment that made all the difference. The first trial actually showing that PCR is a prognostic factor for disease-free overall survival was a small German trial, just a one-arm trial, EC followed by three weekly paclitaxel plus testuzumab. We can see here how well these patients do who got a PCR, and I think this trial and many others stimulated interest in the neoadjuvant therapy. What we're still struggling is the fact that we don't know how PCR impacts on survival. We, we know that it, the trials mostly are too small to show a direct impact. And in HER2-positive disease, the German data shows that in, in luminal HER2-positive, probably PCR is not such a good prognosticator as in non-luminal HER2-positive. The FDA data slightly differs from that. They show a smaller Incre increase in benefit if you have a PCR, but still not as great as in the non-luminal HER2s. But what we've learned from the FDA meta-analysis is that in HER2-positive, hormone receptor-positive uh, tumors, the PCR rate's about half of those as in the hormone receptor-negative tumors, so PCR differs by hormone receptor status, and that if you don't give anti-HER2 therapy, the PCR rate's about half of that than in the context with anti-HER2 therapy. The trial that actually changed our practice was a very small uh, phase two study, which showed for the first time then adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab, so giving a dual antibody blockade together with a taxane almost doubles the PCR rates. This is in breast PCR, the total PCR rates are slightly smaller. And it also showed that if you just give the two antibodies, there's still a 17% PCR rate. This trial changed practice, not because this was the best trial ever, just because the totality of the evidence, and I would like to emphasize that, it's not this trial and the PCR rates, but the totality of the evidence at the time 
with the overall survival advantage of the Cleopatra trial as well as the Affinity trial already completed that made the FDA approve this regimen in the neoadjuvant setting. So we cannot conclude that the neoadjuvant setting is a very good path forward for approval because this still is the only trial that showed that. And I just also would like to emphasize that all of these patients had anthracyclines after surgery, so it's by no means a chemotherapy de-escalation trial. If we look at uh, what the current standards are to deliver neoadjuvant therapy together with the dual blockade in the, in, before surgery, we can do an anthracycline taxa in sequence. This is from the Trifena trial, which actually looked at cardiac toxicity, but nicely shows us what we can expect from the different regimens. It had the um, dual blockade together with the antibodies in the, in the first arm. It had just the um, anthracyclines, then taxin plus dual blockade in the second arm, and the anthracycline-free TCHP regimen in the third arm. The cardiac toxicity, there was nothing to worry about. We know that. We also know that from the metastatic setting. And what we saw in Trifina, and my colleague Dr. Schneeweiss from Heidelberg presented that many years ago already um, at, at San Antonio, was that we see substantial PCR rates. This, again, is in breast. The total PCRs are somewhat smaller, but we can see there's a difference between hormone receptor positives here in yellow and hormone receptor negatives in in blue, and we can also see there is no substantial difference between the chemotherapy arms. So anthracycline taxane sequence or TCHP are both good regimens. With regard to whether we have to give the antibodies already with the anthracycline or with still only with the taxane, you get the idea that maybe in the hormone receptor negatives it's beneficial to give them right away from the start of chemotherapy in the hormone receptor positives. We don't see a difference, but I think the data is not strong enough to recommend this. There's also an older trial uh, from the American surgical uh, study groups where they looked at antracyclines given with the anti her 2 blockade and then taxane followed with the anti her 2 blockade or um, uh, anthracyclines without anti HER2 and then the taxane, we can see there is no difference with regard to PCR rates. And the cardiac toxicity was not uh, worth mentioning. So, so it's, it seems to be safe to give antibodies together with, um, with the um, anthracyclines, but by no means it, does it increase the PCR rate. So for the time being, one should not recommend this to do this routinely in clinical practice. There's also another meta-analysis out there, but it just collects the older trials before 2010, so I don't think it's very telling in this regard. So before we come to new concepts, let's just revisit, um, do all patients actually in HER2 positive early breast cancer need neoadjuvant therapy with dual blockade? And I think this is going to be one of the most cited publications at least after 12 o'clock today. The Tulane data, you all know it, the APT trial, very clever design. And despite all these trials in HER2 positive breast cancer to increase PCR rate, actually a simple trial like that, um, change clinical practice. So uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. But I think uh, from the APT trial, and this is the three-year data, but there's also seven-year data out there with just four invasive recurrences um, in, in the seven-year follow-up. So I think it's pretty safe to say that in node negative patients with, with a two centimeter tumor or less, um, adjuvant trastuzumab plus paclitaxel is a safe option and we don't need to escalate anti her therapy in these trials in these patients and we certainly don't need to escalate chemotherapy in these patients. So let's look at what, where are we going? So when, when we, we need new concepts for tailoring therapy because I think we're still over-treating a lot of our um, early stage HER2-positive breast cancer patients. We can look at PCR and non-PCR for de-escalation or escalation, both in the neoadjuvant and the adjuvant setting, and also look at um, other ideas for post-neoadjuvant targeted therapy um, besides TDM1. If we want to take this forward, we also need to look at different strategies according to molecular subtype, look at luminal versus non-luminal HER2-positive disease, and obviously also look at the HER2-enriched population because all the trials show that there is increased sensitivity for anti-HER2 therapy in these tumors. 
we need to look at early response assessment and then also at the introduction of new therapeutic options like immune therapies or novel anti-HER2 therapies. This is sort of an overview and I made the curves particularly small. You can't read all the trials, the single trials. Just to show you, this is a hormone receptor negative and hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive disease. And we've done many, many trials and Eric Weiner called it preaching at the altar of PCR, where we try to increase PCR in this disease by adding and adding and adding. And where did it get us? It didn't change clinical practice. Um, the, and the absolute PCR rates, you cannot compare between the trials because they have completely different inclusion criteria and other patient populations. If you look here, this is our ADAPT trial um, looking at hormone receptor negative, HER2 positive disease with an 80% PCR rate in those patients just with paclitaxel and dual blockade. I'll get back to that in a minute. But these were intermediate risk patients and they didn't have large tumor volumes because Germany is a screening uh, country. And on the other hand, if you look in the hormone receptor positive disease, here again are the ADAPT data where you can see that 12 weeks of TDM1 give you similar PCR rates as anthracycline taxin plus dual blockade, be it lapatinib or pertuzumab. So I don't think we can judge from absolute PCR rate on the quality of a regimen. And all of these trials fail to show that um, there is a survival benefit according to the PCR benefit. The trial that did change clinical practice also used the neoadjuvant concept, but it used it in a smart way in order to pre-select patients for whom then the magnitude of benefit for the new intervention would be greater than staying with the current standard, which is trastuzumab. And I just don't want to talk about this much because Dr. Kropp is going to talk about the adjuvant approaches in her to positive disease afterwards. I just want to highlight the fact that this was a very simple trial. It basically took all tumors but the PT1As and PT1Bs um, before chemotherapy, and then the chemotherapy component was just requested to take nine weeks of ataxane and nine weeks of trastuzumab, and everything else was very pragmatic according to clinical practice. And the other thing I would like to point out is that the um, decision to treat with anti-HER2 therapy in this trial also after surgery was based on the initial tumor biology. The, the question we always have when we present the uh, Catherine data is, well, how does this fit into our world of also having affinity approved and dual antibody blockade for one year? I think one of the answers we will get from the Christine trial where the survival data is due um, later this year, because Christine compared a standard chemotherapy, TCHP, and then after surgery gave dual blockade for the whole year, and it also um, took an experimental arm, which was TDM1 plus P, and then continued that also in the adjuvant setting. And Christine will, will tell us how the dual blockade does after neoadjuvant therapy, depending on PCR and non-PCR, so we'll get a hint on that. And it will also show us how sustainable a PCR is reached under just a novel therapy here in blue TDM1 plus P, because those patients never got systemic chemotherapy. You can see here the primary results of Christine, they have been published where there is a difference between hormone receptor negative and hormone receptor positive, and there's also um, a difference between the two regimens favoring the standard chemotherapy plus dual blockade. But if you look here in the Christine, look at the 35% um, PCR in ERPR positive, this is very close to what we saw in the ADAPT trial. So in Germany, we changed our guidelines this year. For the first time, we put in a slide on post-neoadjuvant therapy, and I would just like, like you to focus on the HER2-positive part. And here we basically say in, after PCR, trastuzumab is the standard. In high-risk patients, we can do dual blockade, and if there's non-PCR, the standard of care would be TDM1. There is some, uh, some colleagues who say, well, um, if you have PCR, we should de-escalate everything. And I think we need to be careful and not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We've reached such high rates of cure in these her positive patients that we should be very careful with de-escalating without the proper evidence. And there is a very nice poster by my colleague Jens Huber from the G GBG at San Antonio where they, where they were able to show that the initial tumor load also predicts for relapse after PCR. So I'm 
all four de-escalation concepts um, after PCR, but I think they need to be evidence-based and not gut feeling-based. So what did we see in our ADAPT trials? We did two trials in the different subtypes of HER2-positive early breast cancer. In the hormone receptor negative population, we saw a PCR rate for Paclitax and dual blockade of 90%. We had to stop the trial early because the difference was so much greater than we had expected compared to um, dual antibodies alone. And before the trial, I used to be a great believer that there's a lot of patients we can just treat with anti-HER2 therapy, optimal anti-HER2 therapy, and now I'm not so sure, and I think maybe a little bit of chemotherapy um, is quite the way forward, and 12 weeks of paclitaxel with scalp cooling is a very, very good regimen. The other thing we learned was we also looked for early response after three weeks of anti-HER2 therapy, and even we, we saw some early responders in the antibody alone group, um, even those early responders did not have a 90% PCR rate at the end of the day, so maybe just a simple chemotherapy-based regimen and then selection after that is the way forward. In the other trial, we looked at TDM1 um, for 12 weeks, and I think everybody, not just us, was surprised to see how effective this can be, and endocrine therapy doesn't alter that in 12 weeks. And we will have the follow-up data in 2020, and that will show us, together with Christine, whether all PCRs are created equal and how sustainable this PCR is with regard to patient outcome. Obviously, um, here's some nice data from the ADAPT trial seeing that there is increased immune, immunogenicity in tumors after three weeks of TDM1, so maybe one way forward is a combination with immunotherapy in properly selected patients here. And the follow-up trial, which is already fully com uh, completed, looks at paclitaxel here in AMB plus the dual blockade versus endocrine therapy plus dual blockade in hormone receptor positive patients. And again, chemotherapy after surgery, after PCR is optional. So I think all of these trials will help us to understand how we can de-escalate. There's other ways forward for patient selection. This is very nice uh, trial done by uh, our Italian colleagues, and they looked at key 67 response under letrozole after two weeks, and what they found was that patients who responded well also had a 20% PCR rate here with letrozole plus dual blockade, versus the patients that did not respond well, they switched them to paclitaxel plus dual blockade, and again here, 81% PCR rate, quite similar to what we saw in the ADAPT trial, and also, uh, in this trial, like in many others, her to enriched populations had a greater response rate at, at, at time of surgery than the luminal her twos. but by no means we should withhold uh, anti-HER2 therapy from other subtypes. They also benefit, they just don't benefit enough. Another way forward for early um, response markers would be PET-CT here after just one cycle. It's not the PET-CT on day one on the upper uh, curve that is relevant, but it's the decrease of the um, standard uptake values that will be telling with regard to who will get a PCR and who won't. And lastly, about predictive biomarkers in the neoadjuvant setting, there's a lot of research out there, and Sibyl Leubel, our chair today, she's not only published the GBG data, but also very nice meta-analysis on biomarkers, but this hasn't changed our clinical practice yet because all patients benefit. We just know that the PIK3CA mutated population benefits less from anti therapy, but this could be a way forward in patient selection. So how do I foresee the future of our trial strategies? And I think this is somewhat similar to what you've heard today by, um, by Professor Weiner, but it's, it's in her to positive early breast cancer, take out the Tulane group here. They, they do fine just with surgery first, but if it's a tumor larger than two centimeters and node negative or node positive, just give them a little bit of, of chemotherapy, paclitaxel weekly and dual blockade, or do a molecular subtype-based therapy de-escalation. Then look at the results at surgery. Patients who have a PCR, we continue with trastuzumab, add pertuzumab if uh, they fall into the high-risk category. And in the non-PCR patients, we know we can give them TDM1, obtain better results, but we should not forget the more we de-escalate, maybe to add also standard components of the treatment like antracycline chemotherapy. And to make this even more complicated, 
We could also use the clinical response after these two selection mechanisms to move forward and say patients who do not have a clinical response will also not have a PCR, so we could verify this by biopsy and then escalate the neoadjuvant chemotherapy already or neoadjuvant therapy already in order to improve outcomes. There is a number of de-escalation trials already in early breast cancer, HER2 positive disease without systemic chemotherapy with quite encouraging PCR rates. And we will see whether this is the way forward, at least for the first part of the algorithm for selection of uh, exquisite responders. And, and you already saw the COMPASS trial this at lunchtime today. This is the prelude of the COMPASS trial already ongoing in the US, the Daphne trial, where they actually took this approach, took the minimal chemotherapy approach together with optimal HER2 therapy here, um, THP, and then at surgery, if there is a PCR, just do the antibodies. If there is no PCR, um, do your standard therapies. So in summary, just for the standards, I think neoadjuvant chemotherapy with dual antibody blockade has become standard of care in HER2 positive early breast cancer, at least in, pay in tumors which are greater than uh, two centimeters node negative, and they need to be followed by one year of anti-HER2 therapy. The chemotherapy backbones are either anthracycline, taxane, or um, docetaxel plus carboplatinum. I think paclitaxel weekly is a reasonable backbone. We, have, we do have good data, and the um, impact of carboplatinum in the metastatic setting is quite controversial, and we should use the anti her therapy concurrently with the taxane. We should do um, uh, another immunohistochemistry in the non-PCR specimens, and we should use that information if we have a gain of receptors, not if we have a loss of receptors. Keep in mind, Catherine randomized based on the initial histology, but I think it's worthwhile to learn um, from these non-PCR patients. And the adjuvant anti-HER2 therapy should be based on PCR. And it's always important to emphasize the multidisciplinary approach right from the beginning. Otherwise, you cannot treat these patients in an optimal setting. And I already talked about the Tulane regimen. So for future de-escalation, let's have an outlook on what's going to happen in clinical trials. I think we can de-escalate chemotherapy. We should also think about de-escalating type and duration of anti her therapy after PCR. We can escalate looking at new drugs, um, looking at the subtype and integrating early response assessment. But I think today, in the year 2019, neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy are components of an integrated, continuous strategy in HER2-positive early breast cancer, which allows that clinically already on Monday to uh, therapy adaptation according to individual tumor response. And if we use this in a smart way, this will make the magnitude of benefit for our patients great, um, both in the clinical trials and an individual level. And since we're all not here to design trials but to treat patients on Monday, I would like to close with the treatment algorithm. I think if you have a patient with her to positive early breast cancer, if the tumor does not fall clinically into the Tulane categories, do neoadjuvant chemo plus dual blockade, um, get your multidisciplinary team in order to clip the tumor so you can do proper surgery. And then we talked already about the piece, what to do in PCR and non-PCR. TDM1 is not registered in this and it's not reimbursed. That's why I wrote discuss. I think after um, this has been done, it's approved and reimbursed. We should offer it obviously and then do the rest of the treatment. And one more thing, a patient doesn't come and say I'm candidate for Tulane regimen. They may turn out to have positive nodes after after surgery, so you have to have a plan B even for those patients, about 10 to 20 percent. Um, the ones that do follow what they, you saw clinically, you can treat with the Tulane regimen, and for the others, fortunately, with the affinity registration, we have a plan B. But this is getting now awfully complicated, so I think I should leave the rest to Dr. Krop. Thank you very much. <laughs>